Hello everyone, welcome to A+. Plus. Today I'm going to talk about health beliefs. Our health beliefs are predictors of our health behaviors. According to Joseph Dominic Matarazzo, there are health behaviors that have a negative and positive effect. He called the negative behaviors the behavioral pathogens, such as smoking, eating foods high in fat, drinking large amounts of alcohol, lack of physical activity. Behaviors that might have a positive effect, he called it the behavioral immunogens, such as toothbrushing, wearing seatbelts, seeking health information, having regular checkups, sleeping an adequate number of hours per night. Health psychology agrees that knowledge plays an important role in health behaviors, but emphasizes that it's necessary to understand the ways in which people think about their behavior. For this, we're going to focus on four key approaches of health beliefs, attribution theory, and the related notion of health locus of control, risk perception, which has been explored in terms of unrealistic optimism, risk compensation, and self-affirmation theory, motivation and self-determination theory, and self-efficacy. Attribution theory. It is a theoretical proposition about the process by which people describe motives to their own and others' behaviors, and particularly whether these motives are either internal and personal or external and circumstantial. This can be explained in the following dimensions. Internal versus external. For example, my failure to get a job is due to my poor performance in the interview versus the interviewer's prejudice. Is stable versus unstable. For example, the cost of my failure to get a job will always be around versus was specific to that one event. Global versus specific. For example, the cost of my failure to get a job influences other areas of my life versus only influence this specific job interview. Controllable versus uncontrollable. For example, the cost of my failure to get a job was controllable by me versus was uncontrollable by me. In health psychology, it is important to understand the health locus of control. Locus of control is a construct that is used to categorize people's basic motivational orientations and perceptions of how much control they have over the conditions of their lives. This can be internal or external. Individuals differ as to whether regard events as controllable by them, an internal locus of control, or uncontrollable by them, an external locus of control. Wollstone and Wollstone develop a measure of the health locus of control which evaluates whether an individual regards their health as controllable by them. For example, I am directly responsible for my health, whether they believe their health is not controllable by them and it is in the hands of fate. For example, whether I am well or not is a matter of luck, or whether they regard their health as under their control or powerful others. For example, I can only do what my doctor tells me to do. Although the concept of health locus of control is promising, there are several problems with it. To identify if the health locus of control is a state or a trait, is it possible to be both external and internal at the same time? Is going to the doctor external? The doctor is a powerful other who can make me well or internal. I am determining my health status by searching out appropriate intervention. Risk perception. One key health belief that people hold relates to their perception of risk and their sense of whether or not they are susceptible to any given health problem. For example, people might believe that because their grandmother smoked all her life and didn't die until she was 85, they are not at risk from lung cancer if they smoke. In contrast, others may overestimate the risk of illness, believing that obesity runs in their family and there is little they can do to prevent themselves from becoming overweight. Perceptions of risk have been studied within three frameworks, unrealistic optimism, risk compensation, and self-affirmation theory. Unrealistic optimism. According to Professor Neil D. Weinstein, one of the reasons that people continue to practice unhealthy behaviors is due to inaccurate perceptions of risk and susceptibility. Professor Weinstein conducted a study where he asked subjects to examine a list of health problems and compared to other people of the same age and sex. What are the chances of getting a given health problem? The questions were leveled as greater than, about the same, or less than theirs. The results of the study showed that most subjects believed that they were less likely to get the same health problem. Weinstein called this phenomenon unrealistic optimism, as he argued that not everyone can be less likely to contract an illness. According to Weinstein, there are four cognitive factors that contribute to have unrealistic optimism. Lack of personal experience with a the problem. They believe that the problem is preventable by individual action. They believe that if the problem has not yet appeared, it will not appear in the future. And they believe that the problem is infrequent. These factors suggest the perception of risk is not a rational process. In an attempt to explain why individuals' assessment of their risk may go wrong and why people are unrealistically optimistic, Weinstein argued that individuals show selective focus. 
He claimed that individuals ignore their own risk in Christian behavior. I might not always practice safe sex, but that is not important. I'm focused primarily on the risk reducing behavior, but at least I don't inject drugs. He also argues that this selectivity is compounded by egocentrism. Individuals tend to ignore others' risk decreasing behavior. My friends all practice safe sex, but that's irrelevant. Therefore, an individual might be unrealistically optimistic if they focus on the times they use condoms when assessing their own risk and ignore the times that they do not. And in addition, focus on the times that others around them do not practice safe sex and ignore the times that they do practice safe sex. Risk compensation. Risk compensation can be understood by our risk perception. We are exposed to often competing desires and motivations. For example, we might like eating cake but want to be thin. Some individuals offer an extremely healthy approach to life and ensure that all their behaviors are protective and that the only desires they give into are the healthy ones. Many, however, show risk compensation and believe that I can smoke because I go to the gym on the weekend or I can eat chocolate because I play tennis. From this perspective, Perspective, people believe that one set of risky behaviors can be neutralized or compensated for by another. Tida Radke and colleagues have developed a skill to assess compensatory beliefs in the context of adolescent smoking and concluded that more compensatory health beliefs about smoking predicted a lower readiness to stop smoking. They argue that smokers are often in a state of cognitive dissonance. For example, I want to be healthy, but I know smoking is unhealthy, and that compensatory health beliefs may be the mechanism for them to resolve this cognitive dissonance. Self-affirmation theory. Self-affirmation theory suggests that people are motivated to protect their sense of self-integrity and their sense of themselves as being adaptively and morally adequate. Therefore, if presented with information that threatens their sense of self, they behave defensively and either ignore or reject it. However, given the opportunity to self-affirm in another domain of their lives, then their need to become defensive is reduced. For example, if a smoker thinks that they are a sensible person when confronted with a message that says that smoking is not sensible, their integrity is threatened and they behave defensively by blocking the information. If given the chance, however, to think about another area in which they are sensible, then they are less likely to become defensive about their anti-smoking message. Motivation and Self-Determination Theory The motivation to carry out a behavior is a core construct in a lot of research exploring health behavior, and it is widely accepted that an individual needs to be motivated to either start a new behavior or change an existing one. The notion of motivation can be found either implicitly or explicitly in most models of health behavior. It plays a central role in self-determination theory. The self-determination theory focuses on the reasons or motives that regulate behavior and distinguishes between two kinds of motivation. First, it describes autonomous motivation, which relate to engaging in behaviors that fulfill personally relevant goals such as eating nice food or talking to friends. This is also referred to as intrinsic motivation and tends to make the person feel satisfied or rewarded. Richard M. Ryan and Edward L. Desi argue that such autonomous motivation satisfy three basic needs. Autonomy, I can manage my own behavior, competence, I can master my environment, and relatedness. I can develop close relationship with others. Autonomous motivation tends to be associated with the sense of well-being and the persistence of health-related behaviors. Second, it describes control motivations, which are driven by external factors such as the need to please friends and are also referred to as extrinsic motivations. These control motivations tend to make the person feel less personally satisfied and are linked with the avoidance of health behaviors. Self-efficacy. The notion of self-efficacy was first developed by Bandura in 1977 and then expanded as part of his social learning theory, which has been used extensively to explain a range of behaviors from aggression and parenting to eating and exercise. Self-efficacy is the belief of one's capabilities to organize and execute the sources of action required to manage prospective situations and is very closely related to feeling confident in one's ability to engage in any given behavior. Therefore, stopping smoking will be related by the belief I am confident, I can stop smoking, and eating more vegetables will be predicted by I can eat more vegetables in the future. In summary, there are a number of key factors which have been linked with health beliefs. 
attribution theory and the hill locuster control emphasizes attributions for causality and control, whereas unrealistic optimism, risk compensation, and self-affirmation focus on perceptions of susceptibility and risk. Further research has explored the role of motivation and self-efficacy. All these different aspects of health beliefs have been integrated into structured models of health beliefs and behaviors so health psychologists can be able to integrate these models into future research. Thank you for watching. If you like what you watch, please like and share and don't forget to subscribe. Bye.